Hey, welcome to Abide Church Online. I'm so excited that you've joined us today. I pray that today's message encourages you. I pray that it challenges you to grow in your walk with God. And as we like to say around here, we pray that it helps you live, love, and look more like Jesus in everything that you do. Uh, Hey, today, if you have a prayer request or if you want to support this ministry financially, you can do that at our website, right at abidechurch.com. Now, let's get to the message. Hey, today, if you brought your Bible, go ahead and go to Ephesians chapter 6. That's where we're going to be today because we're continuing in a series called The Armor of God. We're doing a a study of Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, we're talking about the different armor pieces that are available to you and to me. And specifically, if you haven't, if you've missed any weeks, go back on YouTube, go back on our podcast. You can watch all the previous weeks, specifically the first week as we kind of laid out the, the revelation that we are in a spiritual war, but God wants us to be equipped for battles that we face. Amen. He hasn't left us empty-handed. He doesn't abandon us to be attacked without any type of weaponry. But in the spiritual realm, God equips us uh, to handle the battles that we face. And so we're in a spiritual war. We're going to face spiritual battles according to Scripture. And so that's why in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, put on the armor of God. And today, specifically, the armor piece that we're talking about is the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Now, that's interesting Because when we think about salvation, what do we think about? We think about our heart. We think about our spirit, which is the innermost part of us. And so naturally, we think about the inside of us. Why would he uh, write the helmet of salvation? Salvation according to or protecting our mind. We're going to get into that today. And so uh, let's get into it first by reading our key verse, Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10. It says this, hopefully you have this memorized by now, but it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I still love that word shod, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, by which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And verse 17, and take the helmet of of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. Once again, the verbiage of Ephesians chapter 6 is what? He says, put on the armor of God. Whose job is that? That's ours, right? That's my job. Take the helmet of salvation. Whose job is that? That's my job, right? So many times we, we I think sometimes um, in, the, in maybe in, in the, the, the modern American church, we, we want God to do everything for us, or maybe the church to do everything for us. Like, well, let my church put on my helmet of salvation, right? Like, no, the, 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 the point is, is that every day, I would take up the armor of God, that I would equip myself throughout, through, throughout my, my week and throughout my day to put on the armor of God, spiritually putting on these armor pieces. And it's not some weird thing to do. We're not putting on imaginary armor pieces. Like you don't go through that action, right? I mean, unless that helps you out. But really what we're doing is as we study scripture, we're seeing, okay, how do I put on the helmet of salvation? That's what we're going to talk about. We've talked about in the past, how do we put on the breastplate of righteousness? What is the, 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 the shoes of, of peace that we're putting on? What, what is the belt? We talked about these things and how to specifically put them on, but it's a daily decision. Here's what's interesting about the helmet of salvation. As Paul's writing this in comparison to the Roman soldier's armor, the helmet of the Roman soldier was a highly decorative piece. It would have been obvious that they were a Roman soldier. It would get your attention. It was something that it was decorated. It was made of bronze. It would have been very heavy and dense. And because of that, they would put this like sponge-like substance or padding almost on the inside because they would have to wear this heavy helmet for so long that they had to make it comfortable or as comfortable as they could. Uh, But it it had bright feathers on it, horse hair on the top of it. It would get your attention. But the helmet was very powerful. It wasn't weak. It it was extremely powerful, and it could handle nearly anything that their enemy could throw at them. 
So if, if, if a sword would hit them in the head, their helmet could absorb that. If a spear, an arrow, um, uh, a battle axe, if they were to get hit in the head, the, the, the helmet would have been strong enough, dense enough to absorb that blow. And then because of the cushioning that they had on the inside, it wouldn't affect them nearly as much as if they didn't have it. Obviously, what is the helmet protecting? It's protecting the most vital part of the body. It's protecting the head. Um, if you've played football at all, um, maybe you've got a, if, or maybe if you just got a concussion before, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Like it's important to protect your head. When I was growing up in high school, my, my senior year, I actually got a concussion. I was running a route and I, uh, we actually have it on video, uh, but I was running this route and I was going to catch this ball. And as soon as my hands touched the ball, I got hit with a helmet right here in my chin and it just spun me around. And um, it's one of those things where I don't remember like the next 24 hours after that, right? But um, people would tell me stories of what I was doing when I got back up and how I was like running around. And it's, I mean, it's a little scary when it first happens. We can laugh about it now, right? Uh, but whenever it first happens, it's a little scary. Why? Because anything that hits your head, anything that comes after your head is a serious thing. And this is what Paul is talking about. And we'll get into this in just a second, but he's saying it's important <laughs> that you put on the helmet of salvation because it's protecting your mind. One of the themes that we've talked about through this entire series is how our battle, the many battles that we face begin in our mind. Um, and so why, why did Paul, why would Paul compare this to salvation? Now, I kind of talked about that a little bit earlier. Why would he say, you know, salvation's in our spirit. It's our heart. Why would he say the helmet of salvation. We would almost many times think that it would be the breastplate of salvation, but let's kind of get into this. One of the things we have to understand about salvation, what salvation is for us. Point number one is this, salvation is an absolute thing. It's an absolute thing. And I'm going to explain this really quickly and show you in scripture here. I'm saying it's an absolute, meaning I can have absolute confidence that I am saved once I've submitted my life to Jesus. Once I've submitted to him, I've repented and I've changed my ways. I've confessed him as Lord and now I'm submitting my life to his word and his will. I can be sure. I don't have to have any second thoughts whether I'm saved or not. I can be absolutely sure. When you put your faith in Christ, you can be absolutely confident. That's what I'm talking about in your salvation. Uh, you no longer have to wonder. Some, sometimes people get struggle, they struggle with, um, well, I just don't feel saved today. Like if you're a new, maybe if you're a new Christian, you might have had those moments, right? Like I woke up and I'm having a bad day and I don't feel saved today, but I have good news for you. Your salvation is not based on feelings. A lot of people come to church and like, oh man, I just didn't get, I didn't get Holy Spirit goosebumps today. I don't think the spirit was moving at church today. It's not about goosebumps and feelings. It's about absolute truth that's found in God's word. See, I don't put my faith in feelings. Feelings are a good thing. Feelings are a gift from God. They're not a bad thing. Otherwise, God wouldn't have created them for us to have them. However, the devil will often use your feelings to fool you. He will often use your feelings to trick you and to fool you into thinking other things that are not in alignment with God's word. We don't put our faith in feelings. No, we put our faith in the word of God. So what does the word of God say about my salvation? Romans 10, 9 says this. If you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Everybody say, will be. I, you will be saved. Not you might be, not hopefully it will happen for you, not if you're just one of the chosen few. No, you will be saved. Is that what it says? You will be. What, what kind of confidence does that give me then in here? What kind of confidence does that give me whenever I don't, well, I don't feel saved today? Well, I got good news. If I know God's word and I've done what it says and it says I will be saved, guess what? I'm saved whether I feel it today or not. And I can have freedom from the condemnation of, well, I just don't feel it right now. I just don't feel that right now. It doesn't matter how I feel. What does the word of God say? He says, believe. He says, say out loud, Jesus is Lord and you will have salvation. Hear me in this. If the power of you believing, if the power of you speaking is enough to save you, save your spirit, save, save you into all of eternity to have eternal life. It's powerful enough to change your life as well. Believing God's word and speaking it is power enough to change your life. It's power enough to change your circumstance, your future, your marriage. It's power enough to, to bring you freedom from sickness or depression. It's powerful enough when I believe and I confess. Believe and I speak. There's something powerful that takes place. We're going to talk more about that next week as we talk uh, and as we kind of wrap up the series when we're talking about speaking God's word and how it's a part of the armor of God. But I'm going to tell you, don't fall for the devil's trap that speaking God's word has no power. 
Think about it, Romans 10, 9, confess with your mouth. God's word must have some pretty strong power behind it if it is a part of my salvation process, right? It must have some power behind it. 1 John 5, verse 12 says this, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, look at this, that you may know, everybody say no, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, not that you may hope, that you may guess, that you may cross your fingers, is it going to work out for me, that you may know. Do you see how when we read God's Word, how much confidence it gives us in the things that the devil will try to use against us to say, well, you're not really saved, well, you don't feel saved, well, you're just not that great of a Christian. Hold on, what does God's Word say? Have I submitted my life to His Word? Am I walking in obedience to His Word? Guess what? If I am, look at the, 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 the concrete verbiage. You will be saved. You may know that you have eternal life. Look, the Word gives us a knowing, and that's what I'm trying to tell you here. The Word gives us a knowing that we are saved and we have eternal life. The Word doesn't give us a just a hopeful someday. No, it gives us more than just I hope it all works out. It gives us me a knowing. I know that I am saved. Now, there's some of you that maybe you've been in church for a long time and you say, man, I just don't, I don't struggle with, like, I know that I'm saved. I don't struggle with that. But I promise you, there's a lot of uh, believers who maybe have been in church their whole life, or maybe they've just submitted their life to Jesus and they face this more times than than, than I, I have these conversations quite a bit where they're just like, man, I just don't feel it. How do I know for sure? It's amazing how the devil will see what tricks will work against who, and he's going to use that to his advantage. So though you may be sitting there thinking, well, come on, Pastor, I know this doesn't feel like a fresh revelation. I want to give some confidence to you that even if he tries to throw it at you in the future, but for those of you that are in here, you say, man, I've struggled with this. I got good news for you today. You don't have to struggle anymore. You can know that you're saved. You can know that you're going to heaven someday. Isn't that good news, somebody? Man, man, such good news. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If I am in Christ, what does that mean? When when I make Jesus, when when I, I say make, we don't make Jesus do anything. When I invite Jesus to be the Lord of my life, amen, right? When I invite Jesus to be the Lord of my life, um, I am now in Christ, meaning we are abiding together. We are remaining as one. We are in close covenant relationship together. Now, in doing so, what does that do for me? It helps me become a new creation from the inside out. New creation does not mean I get a new physical body right away, right? Like, hey, I want to lose 20 pounds, and I, hey, I get saved, and I, man, I'm 20 pounds lighter, and I got a six-pack, right? Like, I wish it worked that way, but it don't work that way, right? Uh, that's not exactly, it's not a new physical body. It's not a new physical brain, but the deepest part of you, your spirit is made brand new. That's a, the new creation that we're talking about. Now, it's the real you, the deepest part of you. That's the part of you that worships. That's the part of you that hears God's voice. That's the part of you that senses God's spirit, that has discernment in the, to the spiritual realm. Our spirits are given a brand new nature the second we receive Jesus as our Lord. And at that point, we receive eternal life. It's the deepest part of us that gets that. And it's from our brand new spirit that we can live out now as a new creation. I can now walk away from sin. I can now leave my old lifestyle. I can walk past, walk away from my old addictions. Now, let me say this. This isn't uh, popular in today's world, but God desires your new life in him to look drastically different from your life before him. Can I say that again? (laughs) God desires that your new life in him look drastically different than your life before him. And I would say if my life as a believer looks identical to the sinful lifestyle of the world around me, I'm not truly living in Christ like I'm called to be. God's word will prune things out of my life. Now, that happens at the deepest part of me. I've got to submit to that spirit and let it go to work in my, from the inside out. There's a man in our church, and uh, this past week he celebrated uh, two years being free from alcohol, being clean from alcohol. Two years. Yeah, that's worth celebrating. 
In fact, uh, he shared his, his testimony with us. You can find it on our YouTube page. It's, it's under Dan's story. Uh, and he shared it. He shared it with us uh, here at church. But I want to say this. That's a perfect example of what I'm talking about here. He was someone who recommitted his life to Christ, who was struggling with alcohol and, and, and addicted to it is what he would say. And he shared in his testimony. But what did he do? He submitted his life. He rededicated his life. And he said, Jesus, help me through your Holy Spirit, help me. That doesn't mean that he didn't have a part to play. No, he had to make decisions as well. But through the help of the Holy Spirit and through his determination to walk away from an old lifestyle that was keeping him from all that God had for him, he found freedom. What? And now his life, two years later, looks drastically different. And I would say the trajectory of his life looks drastically different from where he was two years ago. And that's worth celebrating. That's what God has for us, that our, that our salvation is an absolute, it's something that I can be absolutely sure. I've put my faith in, in him. I've repented from my ways. And that doesn't mean I'm just going out and doing whatever I want and just you know, asking for forgiveness and everything's covered under grace. So it means I've repented. I'm pursuing him. I'm submitting my life to his word, no matter what my opinion is. And in doing so, he creates this new creation in me, a brand new thing in me. And now it begins to reveal itself and produce fruit in my life. But Paul calls it the helmet of salvation. That's, that's what happens in here. But why the helmet of salvation? Point number two is this. The salvation of our souls is a work in progress. The salvation of our souls is a work in progress. Now, our spirit is saved right away, in a moment, in a, in a, in a second, right there. As soon as I submit my life to Jesus, I'm confessing him as Lord. My life and my spirit is saved. I have eternal life. However, my soul, what's my soul? My mind, will, and emotions. My soul, the salvation of my soul, my mind is an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing. I'll say it this way. My spirit is saved and made brand new in one moment, but my head, my mind needs to be saved on an ongoing basis. My mind, that's why scripture says, I'll get to it in a second, renew your mind. Why? My spirit's made brand new in a moment. My mind must be renewed every day. My spirit's brand new in a moment. My mind needs a renewing. That's, a, that's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing. My, my soul's my mind, my will, my emotions. Your brain needs to receive Christ every single day. That's why he says put on the helmet of salvation. Why? It's my mind. My mind. I've got to get the salvation <laughs> from here. I know it's in here, but it's my job to put it on my mind. It's my job to get the mind of Christ, to pursue the mind of Christ. It's my job to get my mind in alignment with Christ every single day. Look at James 1, 21. It says this, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness, that's teachability, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, James is writing to believers. He's writing to believers. These are people that are, they are a part of the church. They're already walking as a disciple of Jesus. So it's interesting that he would say, put away these things, receive with teachability the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Why would he say that if souls were, he was talking about their spirits? No, he knows their spirits are already saved, but he's talking about their mind, will, emotions. He said, your souls need that salvation. James is speaking to believers. We, we, we no longer, what does he say? No longer are you choosing the filthy lifestyle over purity. No, he says, you're believers. Put away that stuff. Put away the things that don't honor God. Put away the things that are ruining your testimony of walking in purity and what God's called you today to do today. He said, put away those things. And in doing so, he said, I'm going to, God's word is going to do a work in you. It's going to renew your mind. It needs to be saved on an ongoing basis. Even David wrote about this in Psalm 23, which probably most of you in here might be able to quote. Psalm 23, verse 3. It says that he, speaking of God, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So hear this. When I begin to think God's thoughts, when I pursue his word, when I'm reading his word, when I'm worshiping, when I'm listening to his word, when I'm listening to messages that are teaching me his word, as I'm doing these things, he is restoring my mind. It's renewing my mind, my soul is being restored. My mind, my will, my emotions are being restored. Then what happens after that? What does the scripture say? Then he helps me walk in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. What is that? He helps me live it out. 
Not only am I taking his word and, and gaining head knowledge, but no, he says, when you do that and you renew your mind, what happens? You're putting feet to your faith now. And now I'm taking what I have a head knowledge of and I'm allowing it to produce spiritual fruit in my life. That's righteousness. What does God say? Walk holy as I am holy. It's a challenge for us to look drastically different than the world around us. But what, is he, what are we seeing here? The theme here is what? I must be conscious of my mind being renewed, my soul being saved on an ongoing basis. Look at Romans 12 too. This, this is the key verse here. And do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That backs up exactly what we just saw in the last two scriptures, right? He restores my soul so I can walk in the path of righteousness. What is Romans 12 too? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. My actions are transformed when I renew my mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Man, I love that because that reminds us God's will is not a mystery. Did you know that? He's not an awful God that says, pray my will, but you're going to have to guess what my will is. No, here it is. Right here. This is God's will. His general will is his word. Amen, somebody? He's not a, a, a bad father in heaven who's trying to make us guess what we should do. No, he's saying, look here, I'm gonna reveal myself to you, and guess what? When I transform my mind, when I, or when I renew my mind, it transforms my, transforms my life, I can now prove, meaning what? I can show, I can reveal God's will in my life. I, meaning what? I can live in God's will for my life. How good is that? How good is that? I don't have to worry. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to worry. Am I in God's will? When I renew my mind, it transforms my life, and now I can show, reveal the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, and I get to walk in it. How good is our God? Amen, somebody? Our spirit is made brand new at a moment of salvation, but our souls, our mind, need to be renewed on an ongoing basis. That's what this is talking about. Have you ever had a day, and I've referenced this in the past about giving your brain a bath, right? Give your brain a bath. You got to wash it with the living word of God. Have you ever had a day where you're just like, if you're being honest, you're like, I, you just needed to take a shower, right? It was one of those days, like, you're working outside, you're doing a project, maybe, you're, maybe you're, your job is outside, and you get home, and you're just like, I got to go straight to the shower, okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm nasty. Whenever Leslie and I moved into a, uh, our house that we're in right now, it was an old 70s house, and in our kitchen, we had a fluorescent light in there, and we were wanting to update the lighting in our kitchen, and so, of course, we took the light down, and my dad was helping me with this project, and of course, behind it is this massive, like, hole uh, behind the light, and so it's not an easy fix. We got to patch the sheetrock and then put in the new lighting, and so, of course, we moved in in, in late August, and so you know, this is a great time to do something that requires me to get in the attic, right? It's perfect time of year. So we, I had to go up in the attic, and it's 100 degrees out, so it's like 120 in the attic, and it's the old nasty insulation, and I'm having to rummage through like feet of insulation to find the hole that we're dealing with, and it was a whole thing. But I was up there, man, I was drenched, I was covered, insulation was stuck to me, I was, you know, wearing goggles, and I had a mask on because there's so much dust up there that I was moving around, and when I came down, I was just like, I don't care if I gotta, you got to hose me off outside, but I need some cold water on my body, okay? Like, I, this is awful. Let me say it this way. In comparison to that example, the longer you go without renewing your mind, the worse and worse your thoughts are going to stink. The longer you go without renewing your mind or giving your brain a bath, the worse and worse your thoughts are going to stink. You're going to have thoughts in your life that you've allowed to stay in, and you are leaving them there. And there's a danger to that. I'll talk about that next here in a second. There's a danger to that. But if I'm not renewing my mind, I'm not living, allowing my mind to be restored, to be renewed in a way that transforms my life. God puts salvation into my heart. Hear me. God puts salvation into my spirit. But it's up to me to put salvation into my head. That's why Paul said, put on the helmet of salvation the helmet of salvation. God puts salvation in my heart, but it's up to me to put salvation into my head. That's put on the mind of Christ. Put on the helmet of salvation. Lastly is this, our greatest battles begin in our minds. This is the common theme for the series, right? I say this, I think I've said this every week. This might have been a different version of this for every single week. Our greatest battles begin in our minds. The devil wants you to doubt your salvation. He wants you to doubt God's word. He wants you to veer off the path of righteousness and, and, and in all of it, where does it begin? It begins in your mind. It begins in your mind. We've talked about this verse a few times throughout this series, but I'm gonna tackle it from a little bit of a different angle. Second Corinthians 
verse 10, or sorry, chapter 10, verse 3 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We're in a spiritual war. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, remember that, casting down arguments, remember that, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And finally, what are we supposed to do? Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Let's, let's break this down here. As we go through life, strongholds are going to try to develop in your life. Things are going to try to set themselves up. A stronghold is when someone tries to fortify their opinion and they defend it against an opponent. They're trying to fortify themselves in a place and, and defend it. It's, a, it's an action. They're defending it against an opponent, whatever that opponent might be, a stronghold. Here's some examples. Maybe you've... Uh, when you were dating, maybe you, when you were younger, you had someone who you were in a relationship with and they cheated on you. And now you're married to someone completely different, but you have a trust issue. It's tough to trust them. And there's something in the back of your mind where you always think that they're not trustworthy, even though they've given you no reason. The person you're with now, the person you're married to now, maybe they've given you no reason to not trust them. But because of something that happened to you in the past with somebody else, you have a trust issue. That's a, that's a stronghold. And it's keeping you, especially if you're married, it's keeping you from being in one with your spouse. That's covenant. And in that stronghold can, can create tension in that covenant. And that's not what God wants for you. That's a stronghold. Maybe for some of you, you, have, you struggle. You can't trust any church or ministry with your finances. Because maybe you've been a part of a church before where the pastor showed up with new clothes every single Sunday and driving a new car every other week, but the church building was falling apart and people were needy and in and, and, and the church and people were starving, but pastor, hey man, pastor had it going on because he was abusing finances in the church. I mean, no, that's not an accurate representation of what God's pastor, God's called pastors to be. Is that right? But that can be a stronghold. Maybe for you, it's anger. Maybe your stronghold's anger. You just think, well, if I, if I don't like how things are going, I can just get angry and bully my way, get my way done because I'll just get mad and I'll just push people out of the way and run over people. And in doing so, I get whatever I want. That's a stronghold. That's a stronghold. See, some strongholds we set up. We set up ways that, that we never change, things that, that we can never get past. And without, I'm a prom, I remind you, without change, there is no growth. So if there's things in my life that I've been defending, parts of my character, well, that's just how I am. That's just part of my personality, but my personality is against God's word, but I'm defending it because it's just part of who, how God's made me. That's a stronghold. What am I doing? That's literally the definition. I'm defending it against what would be, I've made this my opponent. No, I need to submit my life to God's word and let that stronghold be broken, hold down in the name of Jesus. Some strongholds the devil tries to set up. Things like irrational fears, Les and I and our family, we were going on a walk several years ago. We were walking with this family, and as we're walking, we're walking down the neighborhood, and uh, there was another neighbor who had a dog out in their front yard. And uh, this dog came walking over to us, wagging its tail, had its tongue out, just wanted to say hi. And one of the people that we were with <laughs> saw the dog coming, and immediately, the first thing out of her mouth, the dog's walking over, not aggressive at all, walking over, and immediately, the first thing out of their mouth was, we are very afraid. We are very afraid. And I just thought, I'm walking with them. I'm like, I don't know who we is, okay? But I'm fine, okay? I don't know what you got going. That sounds silly. And, you know, I, you know, I don't know every detail. But, you know, maybe she had a bad experience with a dog in the past. But I'm just saying this. Sometimes we allow irrational fears to be set up in our life and we embrace it and we never deal with it. And God says, what if you could get past that? What if you could live free from fear? According to God's word, as he says you can. Like, what if he's that good, Right? Irrational fears, that's something the devil will try to get set up in your life. Addictions, events from your past that you just can't get past. Man, I just can't get freedom from it. Sometimes the devil wants to set up strongholds. Guess what? We have the ability to pull down strongholds according to God's word. The second thing he says is arguments. Arguments, this is interesting. Casting out arguments. Arguments is literally translated from the original language as logical thinking. Logical thinking. Man. This is what happens when you're reading God's word, you're hearing a message, and, and maybe it's, it's a promise from God, and you hear that yeah, but statement come in your, in your spirit, in your mind, right? Like, yeah, God, God's word says that you can be healed. Yeah, but maybe not me. God says he wants to provide for your needs. Yeah, but maybe not me. God says he wants to reveal, he wants to speak to you. Yeah, but maybe I just can't hear God's word. Yeah, but that's a argument against the truth of God's word. That must be dealt with. 
If I, hey, if I think, yeah, buts, every time I read God's word, that's not from God. That's not from God. It's amazing the people that try to convince me of things spiritually, that they meet with me and then they try to convince me of things based on their logical thinking of God's word. And every time I'm just like, if you can show me in here <laughs> what you say you believe, then I will submit to this, but I'm not going to submit to anyone's logical thinking or argument against God's word. We must have the same tenacity within ourselves to not let ourselves, our flesh, argue against God's word. If he said it, what if we just had the faith to believe it and he's that good and we could walk in it? Why not? Sometimes when you walk with God, uh, let, let me say this. We walk by faith, we don't walk in foolishness. I'm not out testing God. I'm not out trying God. I'm not out doing things. Well, I'm gonna jump off the roof and you know see if God said, he said he'd protect me. No, that's, that's stupid, okay? That's dumb. But we do walk by faith and sometimes God's gonna ask you, prompt you, guide you to do things that are outside your comfort zone. Good. The Holy Spirit's called the comforter for a reason because you're supposed to live as you walk by faith uncomfortable lives. Oh, Lord, I don't know. I've never done this before. Good. He said, you gotta trust me. Lord, I, I don't know how to even walk this out. Good, you can ask me. Lord, I don't even know, I don't even know how to raise this kid that you gave me because they're a little crazy, right? He says, good, I know how to because I created them. Amen. See, so many times we, we got to submit and we just got to say, Lord, help me. We must always factor in God. Always factor in God. Every great, great, great hero of the faith had to cast down arguments and trust God anyway. Abraham had to cast down the argument that he was too old to have a son. Moses had to cast down the argument that he was unqualified to lead a nation. Noah had to cast down the argument that people were thinking he's crazy for building a boat when it hadn't ever rained before. There will be times when you have, you have to do things that, that you've never done before, but you've got to trust God. And you get to a point where you've done all you can do and you say, well, God, I'm trusting you. There's nothing else I can do. I'm trusting you. And in doing so, he can show up. He always comes through. Can I say that? He always comes through. It may not be in your timetable, and it may not be the way that you like it, but he is faithful. He is just. He is righteous. He always comes through, even when you don't understand it from your perspective. This reminds us that we are not in charge, and my life is in his hands. Finally, it says, bring every thought into captivity. If a thought is not obeying Christ and not lining up with his word, then it must, it must be captured and it must be thrown out. Bringing every, into captivity, the literal translation from the Greek is to take captive with a spear to the back. I've talked about that. It's an aggressive thing. Take captive with a spear to the back. If I allow arguments, thoughts, and argumentative thoughts to linger, they'll inevitably, inevitably become a stronghold in my life. Don't let them linger take every thought into captivity. So how do we put on the helmet of salvation? I got to get in this. I got to study this. I need to read this. I need to be listening to this. I need to worship. I need to spend time with God however I can. God's word, what does it do? It breaks strongholds according to scripture. It brings freedom according to scripture. It brings peace according to scripture. It allows me to have joy according to scripture. It allows me to have self-control according to scripture. It makes me meek and teachable according to scripture. First Thessalonians 5 talks about the helmet of salvation in this way. First Thessalonians 5, but since we believers belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope and confident assurance of salvation. The word hope here is not wishful thinking. That's not it. But it's the sense of a confident expectation that God's hand is on my future. God's hand is on my future. Why do I put on the helmet of salvation? Because it makes me and it reminds me God's hand is on my future. He's on my salvation. It's on my life as I submit my life to his will for my life. It is on my future in this life and in the next in eternal life. Amen, somebody. What would happen if we put on the helmet of salvation every single morning? It would renew our mind as we get in God's word. We'd fill our mind and our life with God's word. It would give you rest. It would give you peace. You would walk in the perfect, pleasing will of God. Isaiah 26, three says this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That's the helmet of salvation. I am keeping it on. Every day I'm keeping it on. And you could go to bed at night and you could sleep soundly even when you don't have a clue how it's all gonna work out. You have no idea how this next season's gonna go. You have no idea what tomorrow might hold, but anxiety won't keep you up. Why, well, I have the peace of God. 
I put on the mind of Christ, the helmet of salvation. Our anxious minds are settled. We tear down old strongholds and old ways of thinking. We give the devil no access to put new strongholds into our life. And we walk on mission and we have the mind of Christ and we think his thoughts. And when we do that, it prevents the enemy from attacking our mind, which would inevitably lead to our actions and the fruit of our life. Every day, make a decision. I will put on the helmet of salvation. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your word. I thank you for equipping us through your armor. Lord, it's your armor that you've allowed us to have access to. And I thank you that we can put on the helmet of salvation. We can have assurance in our walk with you that we don't have to be led by feelings, Lord, but we are led by a knowing. We know that we're a part of your family. We know that we have access to this new covenant that you've given us. Lord, we know that you have good things for us and we wanna see all that you want to see in our lives and experience it. Lord, we love you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' holy name, everyone said, amen, amen.